Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I have a colleague of mine for many, many years now with me today. Her name is Beth Lambert. She is an author, an educator, and a former healthcare consultant. She has monitored and documented, this is important for parents, the escalating rates of childhood chronic conditions for over a decade. Her first book is called A Compromised Generation, and it provides through a thorough analysis of the origins of this very modern health crisis amongst children and documents how modifications to environmental and lifestyle factors can profoundly influence health outcomes, including full disease reversal. I'm so excited to have you, Beth. I have more to read in your bio, but I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Thank you, Elena. I'm so happy to be with you. And I also want to point out that you are the co-author of a second book called Brain Under Attack. And this is a resource for parents and caregivers of children with PANS, PANDAS, and autoimmune encephalitis. Can you please give us what PANS and PANDAS stands for before we move forward? Sure. Uh, PANS is a pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric syndrome. Um, And then if you add in PANDAS, it becomes um, that same thing, but associated with streptococcus, um, which is a bacteria. So those are both um, terms that are used to describe um, essentially brain inflammation. And there are other terms, autoimmune encephalitis um, is another term. It's just a broad category to describe what isn't just applicable to kids, but can be for adults as well, but it's increasingly um, seen in children, is a state of inflammation in the brain that affects mood, behavior, and learning all kinds of um, you know, health and developmental issues. Okay. So this state of inflammation in the brain, I know we're going really deep really quickly. What are the potential causes of this state of inflammation first amongst children, and then, as you mentioned, it also is a possibility amongst adults. I would love to learn more about this. Yeah, so it's um, a condition that develops usually over time, yet the clinical presentation is seen as something that develops suddenly because the symptoms develop um, quickly. So you could have a totally neurotypical kid with you no know, real obvious outward mental, psychiatric, or neurobehavioral type symptoms who suddenly develops all kinds of symptoms like obsessive compulsive behaviors or anxiety or tics. Um, and there's a whole series of other kinds of symptoms that are associated. But what causes it is usually that you have somebody who's vulnerable, meaning that their immune system might already be compromised in some way. And then there is oftentimes an infection or a trigger that really tips them over. And that's what precipitates the symptoms. At the end of the day, um, this syndrome is um, one of many chronic health conditions that our kids are presenting with that the causes can be categorized as you know, a group or a clustering of things that really just tip a child over. I call it the total load. You've also heard, I'm sure, total body burden. But essentially, it means that the child's body has too many stressors on it. Usually, they're cumulative and synergistic, meaning that they sort of build up over time. Mm. And then there's a breaking point. You know, when you see this presentation of symptoms, it's the body had too much burden to deal with and not enough health supports. You know, health supports help stave these things off. So it could be like sleep or good nutrition or mindfulness practices that help keep that child in balance. So the Mm. causes are diverse, um, but really it can be understood as too many health stressors on an individual child, plus, um, you know, some kind of trigger that sets them over the edge. Understood. Okay. 
I, I want to be very careful and respectful. I am straddling a fence here uh, very carefully. So to our listener, if anything I said is offensive or uh, feels inaccurate to you, I want to say first, I am sorry in advance. I want to ask some really hard questions of Beth, and I have personal experience, dear friends who've had kids with various disorders such as this, including PANS and including autism, in both cases, very sudden onset. Um, and I'm going to ask about things like childhood vaccines. I'm going to talk about things that are not necessarily comfortable for all people. So that's a warning for you in advance if you're listening. In my case, Beth, back to you, I've had uh, a dear friend of mine who had an infant who uh, was vaccinated right on schedule. Um, in my case, I did not get Jonah vaccinated on schedule. I did get him entirely vaccinated, but I did not do it on schedule. I waited until he was a certain weight in my arms until I felt his body could handle intuitively. I know this is deeply, you know, <laughs> intuitive and ephemeral and uh, perhaps inaccurate for some. But I waited until he was a certain weight and I felt comfortable. I would do only one at a time so that I never did a cluster of many. But I watched as this friend of mine who did many, many vaccines uh, all at once, exactly on schedule, her son basically shifted from one day to the next onto the spectrum. Um, and it was scary. It was scary and it was hard to talk about. And it was um, really sudden and it was an infant, you know, basically. And... I have always wanted to ask you these questions for all these years. I've been waiting and waiting to talk to you about this. What I want to ask is this. Do you feel that the cumulative effect that you've just spoken about has to do with vaccines and other environmental factors? So that's a very complex question um, in a very complex social, political, economic kind of um, environment and context. Yes. So what I will say is that um, for decades, parents have been reporting that their child had, um, you know, a set of childhood vaccines and then had all of a sudden a regression or suddenly developed new sets of symptoms or what have you. And most times that's, you know, dismissed as, well, that's not possible. The whole schedule has been tested. It's safe and effective. And, you know, there's that dynamic, almost a tension between what parents' real life experiences are, which I think we should honor, and what the quote unquote science says or what the, you know, pediatricians were trained to know and understand about childhood vaccinations. And I think that the more research that emerges, the more clarity we're getting on this issue. And I myself have been, you know, watching this for over 10 years and documenting stories of kids who have had those kinds of experiences where they've regressed after childhood vaccines. And then I've also been documenting the stories of kids who had chronic health conditions, including autism, but never had any vaccines. So how do you make sense of all of those, you know, very complex data points? And um, what I will say is that we set out many years ago to better understand this phenomenon. So we actually embarked on our own independent research studies um, through something called the Documenting Hope Project, which is a way for us to better understand what is at the root of all these chronic health conditions like PANS and PANDAS that are sudden onset or autism that seems to be such a mystery for people, but really the science is beginning to show us what's going on. And so what we learned through the first study that we've done, which is looking at all the environmental factors that a typical American child might be exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis, including the food they're eating, the toxins that are surrounding them, the childhood vaccination schedule, medications, et cetera. And what we have learned from this validates what we'd sort of known anyway or suspected or understood to be the case based on the science that's out there already. And that is that, again, just as I was saying about the total load, that that is the single most important thing about whether a child develops a chronic health condition, a neurobehavioral condition, or not, whether they stay healthy. It has to do with 
the series of health influencers that were a part of their life, that were a part of their prenatal life, that were a part of their parents' lives. So if you think about each child as cumulatively and synergistically experiencing a series of stressors over the course of their very young life, some kids are just more vulnerable than others. And here's a classic example is that you might have a child who um, was born with an altered gut microbiome, um, meaning that they had imbalances in the bacteria in the gut, which are really, really important for immune function. So if you take that child who sort of came into this world with that vulnerability and that child's going to develop ear infections or have a fever or something that precipitates the prescription of antibiotics that wipes out that child's immune system. So if you give that child a whole series of childhood vaccines on schedule, that child's going to have a totally different outcome and not respond well to those vaccines as compared to a child who has um, never had any antibiotics and comes into the world with good, healthy, robust, diverse gut bacteria. So that's, I think, the, the nuance we need to understand here is that each child is individual. So just because vaccines may have harmed one child doesn't mean that they're going to harm all children, but they should be evaluated in the way I just described. Is this good for this child right now? And the way you described your own experience with Jonah is you as a parent, which I always think these decisions should be parent-led, you as a parent know your child better than anyone else. And you have such strong gut maternal instincts to be able to direct the care and love of that child. So you're going to be able to better understand whether it makes sense to go along with a one-size-fits-all standardized childhood vaccination schedule or whether it makes sense to do things on a different timetable or maybe talk to a specialist about your child's vulnerability to a potential injury. So that's, I think, something that's missing from the entire conversation is bioindividuality and looking at people as individuals and, you know, what are the factors that make them vulnerable or more resilient to, you know, the effects of something like vaccination. And that goes for anything, really, any kind of thing that might stress the body like a vaccine does, you need to evaluate the individual's capacity to effectively and safely tolerate it. Thank you for that very thorough explanation. I am so grateful for the work that you've done, and I want to point out to our listener some of the places where they can find you. The first is Epidemic Answers, okay, and that's at epidemicanswers.org. And that's a real sort of broad brushstroke of what you've done and the learnings that you've had. But the Documenting Hope Project is what I want to talk about mostly for the duration of our time. I think this is important. Can you lead us into the genesis of that? Sure. So as I was um, writing my book, this is well over a decade ago, my book looks at the environmental factors um, that have contributed to this epidemic of chronic conditions in kids. And in better understanding that, I started talking to physicians and um, researchers and different kinds of practitioners who had experience recovering kids or, or reversing the health problems that these kids were presenting with. And when I met these um, doctors, they would say, yeah, oh, you know, 20% of my kids in my practice, you know, fully reverse their conditions, you know, even including things like autism, which people describe as genetic and brain-based and intractable, something that you can't reverse or you can't recover from. And then there would be other things, autoimmune conditions, et cetera, that, you know, again, people think are genetic and lifelong. But here I was witnessing all of these stories, these anecdotes of these kids who had fully reversed these chronic conditions. And so I needed to understand, you know, what was going on there and and why was that happening for some kids and why wasn't this available in my pediatrician's office or why don't, you know, people know that this is happening. So we as a team felt that we needed to actually conduct science that looked at how and why this happens, this phenomenon of recovery happens. Because again, it cannot stand in the realm of anecdote if it's possible. If this is something we can actually do for kids, why isn't anyone studying it? Why isn't anyone better understanding what is it going to take to help kids overcome these challenges and return to vibrant health? So we launched a project called Documenting Hope to essentially do the research that nobody else would do. 
you know, my theory is that no one has done this research because there's no money to be made in it. You know, there's no blockbuster drug at the end of it. If we come out with our research and say, okay, we know what's causing all these chronic health conditions and we know how to fix it. It's not a one silver bullet magic thing that you need to fix it. We knew that was the case and we knew that we had to be the ones to do the research. So we set up two research studies that are both IRB approved and both of them are underway right now. The first study is something that we launched in 2018 and that's the one that looks at all the environmental factors that kids are exposed to and compares them to their health outcomes, diagnoses and symptoms, et cetera. And we're seeing some amazing results out of that one. And our second study is um, a longitudinal study. And this one is um, actually looking at how does that recovery happen? So we're taking a small group of children who have a chronic health condition, and we are doing everything we can to help them reverse it so that we can document how it happens, why it happens for this child, and what's it going to take to expand this learning and bring it out to other families so they have access. So that was really the impetus is that we wanted to, first of all, understand again what the factors are that are making our kids sick, and second, to help understand how to reverse it so that we can make it available for more families. Wow. It's just such a a daunting, huge, um, multi-year scandal, like... I'm so proud of you. I'm <laughs> on behalf of so many of the families who are suffering with these sort of uh, undiagnosable, you know, by a regular doctor uh, conditions. I'm really thankful for you. Um, oh, thank you. I mean, that's yeah. just that you just described why we feel it's important to make this happen is because there are so many families out there that are struggling. And it's not like this has always been there. You know, infectious diseases have long been part of human experience, but the chronic diseases we're seeing in children right now, that's Mm. new. That's a function of living in the modern world. And our data from our research is now supporting that. And now we need to help people get out of this mess. So that's really what this is about, is we just want to help people who are struggling right now who don't need to be struggling. Mm. I have so many different questions to ask you. Um, Can you teach me a little bit about the first two books and for whom are those two books ideal? Like if our listener is here with us right now, why would she or he read A Compromised Generation? Why she or he would read A Brain Under Attack? Talk to me about that. So A Compromised Generation, I wrote that book partly as a kind of wake-up call. I wrote it for my pediatrician. I wrote it mm-hmm. for you know the many doctor friends I have out there who don't see this problem for what it is, sort of a social and cultural phenomenon. Um, and so this book is for any parent who maybe has a child with some kind of diagnosis or maybe some kind of soft symptoms like chronic constipation or chronic sinus infections or behavioral issues or uh, maybe a language delay. You know, the parent who's out there who has some kind of struggle, some kind of challenge that they're moving through with their children right now, this book is for them to understand why that's happening. And also, importantly to let them know that they're not alone that they're you know they're more than half of american children have some kind of chronic health condition and i wanted parents to know just how prevalent this is but more important than that is that there's hope i wrote that book also so that parents and doctors and anyone who's paying attention to this anyone who cares about kids um could see that there's light at the end of the tunnel that there's hope for disease reversal so at the back of a compromised generation there are recovery stories. And that Mm -hmm. is how I want people to hear about this work is to to start there, to know that it's possible. So the the stories to me are the most compelling wake-up call for parents, doctors, anyone. If it's possible for this child over here, certainly it may be possible for your child. So that's an important part for me is to... um, you know, let parents know that that is available as a resource. So a compromised generation is for any parent who has an impacted child. 
any parent who has um, a child with soft signs or symptoms, even be a grandparent, anybody who loves a child, <laughs> really, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. it's a social and cultural wake up call um, with regard to how we're living, but also what we can do about it. I really wanted it to be very empowering in its message as well. My second book, uh, Brain Under Attack, that one was written very specifically for a small subset of parents who are dealing specifically with pans, pandas, or autoimmune encephalitis for their children or their teens or, you know, even a young adult. This is um, a very complex medical condition, extremely challenging for the parents. It's emotionally overwhelming to have a child that has these symptoms because you've heard parents who have um, described it as my child went, quote unquote, suddenly crazy. I mean, literally that's how it's described. And some of these children are admitted into psychiatric units in hospitals. I mean, that routinely happens because nobody knows what's going on. The child was normal, functioning, happy, go lucky. And then all of a sudden, bam, they turned into something that parents can only describe as psychotic. So this book was written specifically as a resource and a guide for parents who have that kind of situation they're going through. And so we provide, you know, an understanding of what's going on physiologically with their child, why those symptoms develop, but also what to do with it. We have a step-by-step plan about how you dig yourself out of that situation because it's really so, so overwhelming. This is extremely helpful to have that clarity on the book projects. And then finally, you had a few other studies um, back when you and I first met the, many years ago, almost a decade ago. Um, the CHIRP study, the flight study, I would love to hear about what was yielded from those studies. Sure. So the CHIRP study is actually still ongoing. We're still collecting data in that one. But to share some of the preliminary data that we've seen, um, we have, again, surveyed a wide swath of parents who have kids between the ages of 1 and 15 to find out their full medical history, their daily life, uh, their exposures, what they eat, what their sleeping patterns are, you know, um, what their screen time looks like. I mean, if you can imagine it might influence your health positively or negatively, we've asked questions about that in the CHIRP study. And then we correlate that with the health outcomes, so the symptoms and diagnoses, et cetera. You know, the key findings we found right now, number one, is that total load is a real thing. Like we have validated that. So the kids who have the greatest number of stressors um, in our database have the worst or more most complex health outcomes. Um, can we, can we, I just want to interrupt you for a second. Can we talk about the stressors specifically for the parent who might be listening? Yes, absolutely. So stressor is a term that we use in the broadest sense when we're talking about things in and around the child's environment that might be negatively influencing the health. That's a stressor. So that things that could be a stressor include um, antibiotics, because we know that they wipe out the immune system. It could be things like EMF, electromagnetic radiation from the devices or Wi-Fi. It can include toxic chemicals, so things like fragrance shampoos or laundry detergents. It could be smelly candle that everyone has that they love at Christmas time or whatever it is. It's a chemical exposure. Um, Can be things like sugar in the diet. That's a stressor. Anything that is in the medical literature as a negative health influencer, you know, documented to be such, is flagged as a stressor in our study. There's thousands of them, quite literally thousands of stressors that um, a child may be exposed to in their life. So the total load hypothesis was validated. So that's one thing that came out of the study. The other thing is that we're seeing um, brought, you know, some signal in what is a vast amount of data in terms of the most important stressors. In other words, isolating which stressors are the worst ones. And so, um, so far, what's come to the top uh, in terms of the most impactful stressors are antibiotics. That's the number one health influencer in our database um, that we've seen in our data. Now, the study's not done. It's ongoing. We're still collecting, so the data may shift and change. But antibiotics have a profound impact on people's health. Um, Another one is sugar consumption. 
believe it or not. We always sort of underestimate the impact of sugar and sugar almost feels like a, um, like a rite of passage, right? Sugar in childhood is like something that we just, it's part of every birthday and every, you know, holiday. And it just feels like so normal. It's, it's not normal, it's normalized, Mm -hmm. Um, but it is an incredible stressor on the immune system and it taxes your cellular function and really can have a negative influence. Um, There's a couple other ones that surprised us that came up like EMF exposure. We really did not think that we were going to see EMF exposure as a significant health influencer. We know that it is because of the research that's been done um, separate from our research, but it came up with a much stronger signal than we thought which is interesting. And we hope to dive deeper into that and understanding that a little bit more. Um, So those are some of the top stressors that we're seeing, Um, you know, but again, the really key takeaway is that each little stressor alone may be harmful and it may have a little impact, but when you combine them all together, that's what we really need to be worried about. And so it almost gives parents, number one, a little sense of overwhelm, like, oh my gosh, there's so many stressors in the modern world. What do I do about this? But on the other hand, it's super empowering because if you can um, understand that there are things in and around your child's life that are stressors that are negatively impacting them, it actually really matters to take that stressor load down. So when you decide to switch laundry detergents to something without a fragrance or you decide to you know, take the sugar out of the diet, that all really matters and has an impact. And I think that's a very important takeaway that we've learned from the CHIRP study. And I would also like to point out to the parent who's listening who like me, has had, you know, birthdays with sugar and, you know, all kinds of other choices that have been made up until this very moment here together. First of all, have empathy for yourself. Remind yourself how human you are. And now, given this information, begin. You move forward slowly in small steps. You take a little bit of sugar out of the matrix of your household and your routine And then you put in a little bit more of some sort of lean protein or some kind of green juice or vegetable. And you just very, very slowly and very carefully begin. I love that. I think that's such a beautiful way to advise people. And that is exactly the message that we want coming out of this study because there's so much parents can do and it doesn't have to be all at once and massive. Mm. It's these little increments, these little nudges in the right direction really do matter. I've noticed my kid is now a teenager and um, the best thing that I do is not to force anything, but just to make offers and put things on offer. So he gets to see how he feels after eating X and I don't speak about it. And then I ask him a question. How did you feel after that? Oh, I felt really lethargic or whatever, dull, whatever the case may be. And then I'll ask him how he felt after something else that might have been a better choice. So he's the one who makes the observation. I don't dictate. Yeah, I love that. I think that is beautiful. And I think that it's important to remind ourselves that our children are our teachers and we're their teachers. And and one of the things that we can teach them is just you can lay down a good foundation and we can't necessarily expect them to stick to that foundation of, you know, whether it's diet or, you know, teaching them about, you know, toxins in the environment and staying safe that way or whatever it is, but you can put the foundation down there and they're going to go out and they're going to live their lives and you can hope that they come back to that foundation. But it's ultimately, you know, you're a guide and a teacher, you're not a controller. So Mm. it's that um, piece, which is sometimes hard for parents to let go of when one once they start learning about the things in and around our, you know, our daily life that might be harmful. But I think, like you said, it's just about asking the right questions. How do you feel after that? Or what did you think about when you used that? Did that make you feel okay? That's mm-hmm. a great way to guide our kids towards making better choices. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that so much. And I thought it might be nice to close on, uh, if you have recollection, you may or may not, of one of the kind of reversals, as you say. Such a good word. Do you have a recollection? And maybe you could share with our listener the story. Um, Sure. I mean, there's so many stories that I have documented over the years. Um, 
But one that I'll share, which isn't, um, you know, this is actually something that you can go out and learn more about on your own. You know, if you are interested in hearing more about what happened with this family, there's a book and a series of articles, et cetera, that you could follow. Um, So there is a journalist who wrote for the New York Times a number of years ago named Susanna Meadows, and she had a four-year-old son, Shepard who was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And this was a very sort of sad story where, you know, one day Shepard woke up and he just collapsed. You know, he couldn't walk because his joints were so painful and so swollen. Um, And of course, Susanna knocked on every door and did everything she could to try and help her son. And really all they had was you can put him on methotrexate, which is a chemotherapeutic agent that suppresses the immune system, or other kinds of immunosuppressive pharmaceutical therapies. And, you know, I think she tried that for a little bit and she tried NSAIDs, you know, like ibuprofen for a little while and tried to manage it. But her son was just withering away and just looked miserable. And something in her mommy gut, which, by the way, I think is the most beautiful, profound instinct that we have. Mm -hmm. I would ask every parent to trust that. And it doesn't have to be a mommy gut. It can be a daddy gut. It's a parental instinct. But Mm -hmm. she trusted her gut that something was off with this treatment and that there must be a better way. So she knocked on more doors. And eventually um, what happened is that Susanna learned that her son's rheumatoid arthritis was being triggered and exacerbated and made worse by certain foods he was eating. So in this case, it was gluten and dairy and some nightshades. So she tried a diet um, and it wasn't all overnight. And, you know, she jumped in and did everything. She sort of slowly worked through some testing, some diet modifications, but she changed his diet, took the sugar out um, and, you know, gave him more of a whole foods kind of diet, started working with um, an integrative physician and um, started learning about how his food sensitivities and food allergies that she didn't know about that were actually causing inflammation. And the inflammation was so great that it was precipitating the symptoms of the rheumatoid arthritis. So um, it's a longer journey and story, but the short version is that Shepard fully reversed his rheumatoid arthritis. I believe he's a teen now, and he doesn't have any symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis anymore. And his mom wrote a fabulous book, which I highly encourage you all to read. It's called The Other Side of Impossible. And in that book, you can read about Shepard's journey and his reversal of his rheumatoid arthritis, but you can also read about other people like Terry Walls, who is a professor who um, reversed her MS. So there are all sorts of other stories in that book that you can hear about that are similarly encouraging and inspiring and um, walk away knowing that recovery or reversal is possible. Um, And we just have a long way to go to get our medical community to the place where that's the standard of care. Thank you so much for that. I want to just give you some recognition um, for your service, for your commitment to these families who are without answers and now finally getting some, um, and for the dedication that you have gone ahead and created uh, Epidemic Answers, which is, by the way, I don't think I mentioned before, a 501c3 nonprofit org dedicated to, in Beth's words, reestablishing vibrant health in our children. I don't think there's any more important effort, and I just want to say a tremendous thank you. Oh, thank you, Elena. And I I feel like I'm grateful to you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. Anytime I can get, um, you know, a little bit of someone to pay attention to what's happening with our kids, I know we're going to be heading in the right direction because as soon as people hear about what's happening, most people aren't even aware. People are so um, supportive and kind and want to help. So thank you so much for saying that. Yeah, it's my pleasure. More soon. um, Please don't hesitate Beth, to reach back out when you have more results and more information, because we will have you back. I would love to have you back and talk more about this. Thank you. Thank you so much.